after this session. So, just some logistical. After this session is done, we go straight upstairs. The restaurant for the fondue is right upstairs. There are two ways to getting there. Either we all go outside, you take up the stairs, and it's on the right side of the re reception, or you go. Um, after I had the opportunity to go to Norway to the TOR conference, um, they showed us that it's a good thing to give more than just uh, just uh, water to bleeding patients. And they really gave us the confidence and they helped us because here in Middle Europe we still feel like little goldfish in a huge shark tank. So when we came up with the idea of giving pre-hospital blood, we got attacked from all over the place. Um, with a lot of misleading information. So this is personal at Tories at Zermatt. So I highly appreciate you guys came all the way from overseas and from Norway, from the United States, and have this great speech. So I hand this over. Yeah, hi guys, my name is Christopher. I'm uh, from Norway. Uh, I'm just going to outline the session for today. Uh, first, we're going to have Phil here. He will talk about the paradigm shift in hemorrhagic shock resuscitation. And uh, then Geir will talk after that about uh, hemorrhagic shock resuscitation guidelines, I think. Yeah. And then, and then we will have Pat. He will talk about successful procedures and unsuccessful care. And then it's about 30 minutes each, and then we will have a 30-minute break. And then Phil will come back and talk about uh, hemostatic resuscitation in the pediatric population. And then we will have some U.S. guys who will cover some of the challenges we see on the battlefield. I think there are some visual inputs to you guys. And then at last, I will talk to you about the practical stuff uh, of implementing RDCR um, uh, the procedures in, in the units. Okay, Phil. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for, uh, for coming back for this uh, session on uh, hemostatic resuscitation for traumatic uh, hemorrhagic shock. This is the wrong lecture. I'm going to do that. That's the wrong one. That's the wrong lecture. Yeah, the other one. Um, the one that says Zermatt whole blood rationale. Want to help, maybe? Um, so I'll clearly be talking about pediatric uh, care later. So just uh, by way of introduction, I'm actually a pediatric critical care uh, physician. I uh, was active duty Army uh, for 12 years and deployed uh, to Iraq in 04, 05. And it's interesting, uh, with my pediatric training in Philadelphia, we used whole blood uh, for cardiac surgery in children every day. So using whole blood to resuscitate for hemor post-operative hemorrhagic shock was natural and normal for me. I go to Baghdad 04, 05, and it was right, after, right when Fallujah uh, went to hell, April of 04, if any of you were military and remember it. We had many, many casualties coming in uh, with hemorrhagic shock, and at that point, we had no source of platelets uh, in, in theater. So while some of the other docs I was with were knowledgeable, of, well, knew we could use whole blood, it was my experience as a pediatric critical care doc that helped really um, advocate and push for using whole blood uh, more often that year. And that's kind of led to the entire, well, with, with many influences from many other people. I'm not saying it was about me pushing it. Uh, but a group of us really kind of pushed the, the envelope when it comes to resuscitating patients with hemorrhagic shock. And that's, just, that's kind of why a pediatric ICU doctor is talking to you about uh, traumatic hemorrhagic shock, predominantly in an adult population. <coughs> 
So my talk uh, now is about the Thor itself and the rationale uh, for using whole blood for hemorrhagic shock. We were asked uh, to give a little bit of background about Thor, in case you're, having, you're not familiar with it. Uh, Thor is, is an international multi multidisciplinary network of both civilian and military uh, providers. We have a wide range of, of members within the group, we, for, between medics, paramedics, you know, all the way to all different types of physicians, whether it be emergency medicine, anesthesia, surgeons, uh, et cetera. And we also have, you know, basic scientists that come to the group, uh, to come to the meetings and participate, you know, all the way to clinical uh, trialists. Our vision within Thor has always been to uh, improve outcomes uh, for, for uh, traumatic hemorrhagic shock by optimizing the acute phase of resuscitation. Our mission uh, is to develop and implement the best practices for pre-hospital through the completion of the acute uh, phase of hemorrhagic shock resuscitation, and we plan to do this, or we do do this, through research, training, uh, education, and advocacy. We often also get asked, um, how did this start? You know, uh, why is this uh, network based out of Norway, and why, why is Phil and Gare running this network? Well, it all comes down to communication, someone reaching out to another. In, two th in October of 2010, I get an email, and it's from Gare Strandinus. He says, Phil, I've read your whole blood publications. I think they're great. Um, it's probably drunk at the time. <laughs> and, you know, would you be willing to help me and actually uh, be the chair of my scientific steering committee because uh, I want to do more whole blood research? So I thought about it for about a half a second and said yes. Now, how often does a Norwegian uh, Navy SEAL commander ask you to help, him, help him out uh, to help train his medics? So that's how we met through email. We wound up, you know, very, um, you know, um, ironically uh, meeting in Innsbruck for the first time uh, when I was asked to present at an, uh, one of Dietmar Fries's Stop the Bleeding uh, meetings to talk about plasma. I was kind of the sacrificial lamb going to, to his meeting there to talk about plasma. But Gare came down from Norway to meet with, with me. We went out for a drink that night, and I remember it vividly. We went to Limerick Bill's Irish Bar uh, down the road from, the, from where the conference was. And we started to talk about the, the scientific program we were going to develop and what we're going to do. And I said, you know, if we're really going to move the needle on a, for improving outcomes for patients with hemorrhagic shock, we should just start our own network and start to have a meeting in Norway every year. By that time in, in uh, 11, I have kind of gotten to know all the major players in, uh, in the field. And we just had a one-day meeting uh, in Bergen in 2011. And that was so successful, we just started to then have a meeting at the Solstrand Spa, which is a little bit south of, of Bergen. And now this year will be our 10th uh, year of, of doing it, and um, we haven't looked back uh, since. What's the strength of the network? Just like it is in resuscitation, you know, it's uh, balance. Balance of having uh, the pre-hospital providers there that kind of know what's needed uh, from the scientists. It's uh, having a clinical trialists there with basic science docs, uh, et cetera. It's half military, half civilian by design uh, because we need to learn from each other uh, over time. How we've been, and we've been doing it that way for the past, you know, 100 years or so. Um, so what, does, what do we do within Thor? Our main activity has been, although we're branching out, has been our main, uh, our annual meeting each year uh, in Norway. Uh, from that meeting, uh, we, we publish um, large uh, supplements in um, high impact, well, in, in, in good journals uh, after each year. And then we, and we've been publishing some physician papers too, just to kind of help give you all um, references uh, for um, if you want to try to change practice locally, these physician papers can help uh, to do that. Now, we've now been branching out and having satellite meetings. We've been to Italy uh, twice. Uh, Switzerland's now here twice. We're going to Brazil in, in May. Um, the AABB is the American Association of Blood Banks, uh, Blood Bankers. Uh, we are now are have a standing meeting with them every year to try to teach the, the transfusion medicine uh, crowd uh, about hemorrhagic shock resuscitation. It's been a great partnership. ISBT is more of a European uh, society, International Society of Blood Transfusion. We're planning uh, to work with them at their meetings every year, uh, too. Uh, the 
The medics within the group are developing training material, both uh, text and, and video, to help with uh, training and education for remote damage control resuscitation principles. And then we actually have an entire textbook, a 25-chapter uh, textbook that we are about to uh, publish. Here are just some of the uh, supplement covers that we've uh, published over the years. And here's a position paper on kind of changing the threshold for hypotensive uh, resuscitation. Pat and Gary are going to talk a lot more about that. Here's just what, here's what the textbook is going to look like. Hopefully, it'll be out by the end of the year. <laughs> so uh, within uh, Thor, damage control resuscitation has always kind of been the bundle of care uh, that uh, was meant to reduce death from hemorrhagic shock. But since we started initially, uh, and we still do, focus on the pre-hospital uh, resuscitation, uh, we borrowed a term from the U.S. Army, actually. They coined this, uh, Gerhardt and Blackburn coined remote damage control resuscitation. And that's basically applying DCR principles in the pre-hospital phase of resuscitation. And we feel it's important to, to distinguish RDCR from DCR uh, since um, we're, they're practiced in different environments, so therefore you have different uh, equipment available. Uh, airway management, Gary will talk a lot about this, um, probably should be different in the remote setting versus a hospital setting. And your therapeutic, therapeutic options are often uh, different as well. Another uh, concept, concept we've been promoting is this idea of blood failure. Some people like the term, some people don't, uh, but we like it because what it does, it helps people think about blood as an organ. And there are multiple components of that organ. And when a patient has blood failure, and I'll describe it in a second, it makes you think, okay, so what within, what about the blood organ that's failing needs to be corrected for me to improve outcomes uh, for my patient? So clearly blood, the uh, function of the blood as an organ is to improve O2 delivery, is to main maintain and regulate hemostasis. The endothelium is a, pla is a platform on, on upon which hemostasis occurs as well as vasoregulation and uh, immune function is clearly, you know, uh, carried out within uh, blood itself uh, too. So when you think about blood failing and you think about it that way, it allows you to provide a balanced simultaneous treatment of each of the ways a blood can fail. And here's just a schematic of trauma-induced uh, blood failure because your blood can fail from other reasons too, right? So you have the actual the, the blunt or penetrating traumatic injury. That leads to shock. And it's that shock that leads to then endothelial dysfunction, immune dysfunction, and hemostatic dysfunction, and they're all clearly interrelated. So when some people focus on just, you know, the, the hemostatic dysfunction, right, there's been a lot of talk about trauma-induced coagulopathy, the acute coagulopathy of trauma, all true and, and important, and they need to be focused on. But if you focus on just that, and you forget about the shock, or you forget about the endotheliopathy, you're going to cause more of an imbalance in the system, or you're going to have a less successful resuscitation uh, over time. So again, blood failure is meant for people to think about it, providing a balanced resuscitation, addressing each of these dysfunctional uh, parts of blood function uh, when they occur with shock. So how big of a problem is blood failure, right? Actually, it's interesting. Shock coagulopathy, uh, endotheliopathy based upon syndican uh, release, and even immune dysfunction occurs about 33% of the time for each of these for patients with severe traumatic injury. So it's, it's very common. And actually, each of them are associated strongly with, with worse outcomes. That might seem obvious to you, but there are, there's clear data showing the more initial shock, coagulopathy, endotheliopathy, and even immune dysfunction, they're all correlated with worse mortality. Therefore, uh, we need to uh, work uh, quickly to reverse those conditions to help imp improve outcomes. At least that's the, th that's the theory. So for patients with traumatic uh, hemorrhagic shock, you probably do know the epidemiology, but it's worth going through. It's the most common cause of death from one year of age to, to 46 years of age. Uh, it's, hemorrhage is the most common cause of mentally preventable death. I'm going to go through that, those statistics in, in a few slides later. Um, and you all know, hemorrhagic shock, uh, death from hemorrhagic shock occurs really quickly. And even in hospital, it occurs within one to three hours of admission. But I'll show you a slide where the majority 
of hemorrhagic shock deaths occur pre-hospital. So if we're going to move the needle and improve outcomes for patients with traumatic hemorrhagic shock, we have to start to bring the therapy to the patient. We can't wait for them to get to the hospital. And here's just some data showing you why we need to focus on pre-hospital. The, the vast majority of deaths that occur uh, from uh, hemorrhagic shock are pre-hospital. In the military, uh, KIA is uh, for patients that die pre-hospital before they get to a medical treatment facility. Died of wounds are for patients that die after they get to, in, to the hospital. So if you're thinking about this in civilian terms, KIA is pre-hospital, death of wounds is, um, died of wounds is, is in-hospital deaths. And you can see, I mean, I haven't done the math here, but it's probably at least 66% of, of, of their dying pre-hospital, a third are dying uh, in the hospital. So if we're going to improve outcomes, right, we have to do it quickly. The peak here is uh, 30 minutes after injury, okay? And I know in some cities, the transport time is 30 minutes for some patients, but not, but not for all. Right, so even in large cities where your transport time is short, for the patients that have a very high uh, rate of bleeding, okay, you, you, those patients will die before they get to the hospital. So what we're trying to do is move the needle. Right? We're trying to, to take the patients, instead of just trying to focus on the patients that die in hospital, we're trying to get the ones that are bleeding faster and have more severe injuries and, and more aggressively treat them earlier to improve uh, outcomes. And it's patients like this. Okay, this. This soldier survived. I took care of him uh, in Baghdad in 2004, October-ish. And you can't, you, know, you can't imagine, it's hard to imagine a patient like this surviving, right? But by pushing the needle and getting tourniquets on him very early on scene, uh, the medics got these tourniquets on him within uh, minutes. And back then, this is 2004, we didn't have whole blood pre-hospital. But the second he got into the cache, right, we were resuscitating aggressively with whole blood. That's what you see going through the catheter here. It definitely ain't crystalloids. Uh, and we saved his life, okay? Uh, and it's, I still look at this picture 15 years later, and it's, it's, it's uh, shocking. But this is what we're trying to do, save these patients, okay? Uh, and to do that, you have to be more aggressive and, and provide a hemostatic resuscitation pre-hospital. Oh, so we've heard a lot yesterday uh, about you know, the principle you know, of not taking a knife to a gunfight, right? Which basically means you, know, you don't want to be underprepared for a uh, high stress, you know, a high risk situation. Well, if you, if you take that principle and think about it, you, know, you don't want to take crystalloids to a bloodbath, right? Same, same principle, you know? So Yosemite's got to bring, bring blood to that fight instead of uh, crystalloids. Um, and that's what we've been trying to promote. So now, what's, what are the statistics about preventable uh, deaths after traumatic injury? The data is US-based, but there's about 150,000 uh, US traumatic deaths in the US per year. When we've combined both military and, and civilian data on the rate of deaths pre-hospital and preventable deaths from hemorrhagic shock, pre-hospital and in-hospital, we've, we've estimated uh, with, with good data, that there are 30,000 preventable deaths from he traumatic hemorrhage per year in the U.S. I mean, this is astronomical. It's huge. We don't realize how often people are bleeding to death in the States. And um, I, there may be some countries in Europe where this is not a problem, but I'm sure there are other countries uh, where it is the, the problem is this, uh, this big. And then you do the math. 25,000 of those 30,000 are dying pre-hospital, okay? So I hope I'm, I'm, being, I'm not being subtle here, right? The problem is pre-hospital, and we have to get uh, blood products and tourniquets, dried plasma, TXA, et cetera, uh, to the pre-hospital setting. So the, um, the bundle of care that, that we came up with uh, back in 2004 we, uh, to reduce death from hemorrhagic shock, we called it damage control uh, resuscitation. And damage control is a, a long list of, of principles, again, aimed to reduce death from hemorrhage. You know, what's probably what's most important is recognizing who uh, is at risk of having life-threatening uh, life hemorrhagic shock. It's, it's super simple when they're a triple amputee, right? But you can have a grade 5 liver uh, lack and not really recognize it until it's, it's too late. So we have to come up with methods to identify 
who might be at risk of, uh, of traumatic hemorrhage, of life-threatening hemorrhage. And, you know, point-of-care devices. Uh, there are some groups up the Mayo Clinic uh, in Rochester, Minnesota, is using NEARS technology. They say uh, for them, if the NEARS is less than 65%, 70%, those are the patients that are going to wind up being uh, in hemorrhagic shock. Um, in, in Baghdad, we were using uh, INR at level 1 and level 2 uh, aid stations. They make point-of-care devices to measure INR and, and lactate. I know there are a lot of um, special forces units and the other uh, civilian EMS programs using lactate uh, pre-hospital to identify those at risk of bleeding. Preventing hypothermia, that's a no-brainer. Uh, hemorrhage control with mechanical hemostatic adjuncts, right? Tourniquets have clearly uh, come back for very good reason, and there's been a lot of uh, advancements in the past 15 years with their use, and I think reintroduction back into the civilian uh, world as well. The use of uh, hemostatic uh, gauze as well um, is helpful than, a, than using a non-hemostatic uh, gauze. Reboa, we heard a lot, we heard about that uh, yesterday, and I think um, we'll have a more of a place in the future of being used pre-hospital with appropriate training. There's a, there are investigational products too, intra-abdominal foams that can be injected blindly in the field. They expand and stop the bleeding while not reducing venous return, interestingly. Uh, that will be a big help uh, in the future because it's really, it's truncal bleeding that most of our patients are dying from now. And that may help in the future. Hemostatic resuscitation is the term used to describe the whole blood-based uh, resuscitation uh, for hemorrhagic shock compared to uh, crystalloids. You know, we believe uh, that uh, whole blood is optimal, but if uh, in, hos in hospital, if you don't have whole blood available, trying to reconstitute whole blood uh, one, uh, in a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio with red cells, plasma, and platelets is, I think, the next uh, best thing uh, in general. Although I will say, based upon you know, the conversation we had yesterday, in some people's hands, in some systems' hands, using uh, factor concentrates and fibrinogen and TXA can work uh, prob probably just as well, uh, too. Permissive hypotension, I really cringe when I say that phrase because it's really more about it's permissive um, uh, resuscitation with crystalloids. A lot of that data we saw yesterday, they weren't targeting a blood pressure in their trials. They were e either giving clear fluids or not, right? So it's really, um, we feel it's, it's probably better if you're using blood uh, to resuscitate to aim for a higher blood pressure, maybe around 100 or so if you don't have traumatic brain injury. Uh, so you still don't want them to be hypertensive ever. Uh, but shooting for a, um, a blood pressure that's around a, a 100 or so, I'm sure uh, Gare and Pat will talk about that later as well. Clearly avoiding crystalloid resuscitation, right? You know, but oh, when you give LR or normal saline, all you, you are in increasing the blood pressure temporarily, initially. You may be popping the clot if, you, if your blood pressure goes too high, and you're causing a dilutional coagulopathy, so for those that patients that are at risk of exsanguinating, you're really, in the end, not helping them. It be, may be fine for a patient who might live for the next six hours anyway to get to a surgeon to correct the, um, the, the bleed. Um, but <clears throat> it also causes an endothelial injury too. Crystalloids are actually more pro-inflammatory compared to plasma. People always think plasma is dangerous. Uh, that causes more of an inflammatory injury. Actually, when you, in animal models, uh, it doesn't. Um, Tranexamic acid, a source of fibrinogen, uh, and avoiding hypocalcemia. When you give a lot of blood products uh, that are in citrate, uh, you're going to ha you can have severe uh, hypocalcemia. Calcium is a cofactor for hemostasis, so you want to try to keep the calcium normal uh, too. So what's some of the data uh, regarding the use of blood products pre-hospital? This was a very interesting publication by Stacy Shackelford at U.S. Army Surgeon, it's a retrospective study, so it has sources of bias within it. Uh, it, it, does, it can't, um, we can't c claim causality from this trial. But in this uh, study of about 400 patients, where they matched them by, according to severity of injury, uh, physiologic factors, et cetera, those patients that received uh, blood products pre-hospital, predominantly just red cells, some of them got plasma, but mainly red cells, had a dramatic reduction uh, in death uh, compared to those that received um, crystalloids. So some decent 
I would call it moderate quality data, supporting the use of blood products pre-hospital to improve uh, outcomes. Jason Sperry out of Pittsburgh in a civilian population uh, also just reported in a randomized trial that the use of plasma pre-hospital was improving uh, survival for patients uh, that received uh, standard uh, care. So a fairly large randomized controlled trial published in the New England Journal uh, indicating pre-hospital plasma can improve uh, outcomes. I don't have a slide for it, I apologize. There was a second study, a combat trial done by the Denver group. That study that also compared pre-hospital plasma to crystalloids, they did not show a difference in survival. But when you look, read the two papers closely, you'll notice that the Denver study, patients were um, much less sicker. The ISS was maybe in the 17, 18 range, and don't quote me on that, but the, and the ISS and the Pittsburgh study was in the high 20s. But probably more importantly, the transport time was much shorter in the Denver group compared to the Pittsburgh group too. So yes, plasma may not help you if you're not, if you're not that sick and have very short transport times, but the Pittsburgh study did show a difference. And then when it comes to, to platelets, a secondary analysis of the proper study, which was the large randomized control trial comparing different ratios, did show when patients received some platelets compared to patients that received no platelets, there was better survival for patients that received platelets. Now, you might say to me, Phil, well, no shit, right? These are patients that are, that are bleeding. Uh, of course, when you give platelets, it makes a difference. Okay, but this is a, a pragmatic study in a way because actually, I would, it depends upon where you live, but about 60 to 80 percent of, of hospitals in a large region do not have access to platelets. Okay, many of us are very centric to the, the trauma centers that we work in, right, or the large tertiary care centers that we work in, and we have access to platelets, so this is it's never a problem. The vast majority of, of hospitals do not have access to platelets because of their half-life, I mean their shelf life of five days. So this, what this tells you is that those hospitals that don't have access to platelets, we got to find a way to get them platelets uh, because it clearly makes a difference. Um, and we'll talk more about that at some point. I forget which lecture it's in. And then, you know, clearly time is money, right? Again, a lot of the stuff is obvious, but it's great when you have data to support what, what seems uh, to be obvious. Oops. This, again, was another secondary analysis from the proper trial showing that uh, for every minute that there was a delay in getting any blood product to the patient, there was a 5% increased risk of death. Okay, so if you delay products uh, by, by two minutes, you know, there's a 10% increased risk of death. Uh, so time is money, some data to support it. So, for our patients with traumatic, uh, trauma-induced uh, blood failure, we, we basically, if we agree, and hopefully we do, that with, we need uh, hemorrhagic, hemostatic resuscitation is needed for patients who present with shock, endothelial dysfunction, coagulopathy, et cetera. Right, I, I hope we all agree crystalloids is not the best thing for those patients. I realize there are limitations in your system. The system, then, if it's all that you have, it's all, it's all you have. And what you need to do is move your systems to get away from, from crystalloids. But I think we can agree physiologically. If you're bleeding to death, you don't want to give them crystalloids or even simple colloids. You want to give them blood products to reverse the blood failure. So if you're going to do that, you have two main ways you can go two roads you can go down. You can go down the whole blood approach, or you can try to reconstitute it with red cells, plasma, uh, and platelets. I think in the pre-hospital setting, it's, a, it's, it's not a choice. It's not even a discussion, not even a debate. You have to use whole blood. Why would you ever want to bring three products pre-hospital? You might say, well, fine, I'll just bring red cells and plasma. But if you don't give them platelets, for those that are bleeding the most, that triple amputee kind of patient, you're not going to save that patient if you don't have platelets available. Um, so you have two choices, whole blood or go with uh, components. So is it back to the future with whole blood? Right? Nothing that within DCR, almost nothing is new. Very little is new. Is this all going back to World War I um, resuscitation principles? And it's been published. Uh, Pat has a great chapter coming out in our textbook that goes through all of this. This is all very well known in World War I. We've forgotten it. Or we've allowed the blood banking uh, industry to pull us away 
from whole blood, giving us components, and then we were kind of trying to fit a round peg in a square hole. So before we talk about whole blood, it's really important to, to give some definitions and to provide the perspective. Whole blood can either be warm and, warm and fresh. A lot of our military data that we published was with warm. Uh, whole blood is often transfused within eight hours, and um, although it can be stored for 24 at, at room temp. Uh, it's, in addition to warm whole blood, there's cold stored whole blood. Okay, that is a licensed product in the EU, uh, and it's licensed uh, by the FDA in the uh, US. Uh, it's stored between two to six degrees Celsius. It can be stored up to 35 days, according to current uh, regulations. And some of the civilian data coming out now, or most of it now coming out now, is cold stored. So while they're clearly similar products, uh, you have to they are different. And when you read the literature, you have to know what you're reading. Whole blood can be ABO specific. Early in the war, when I was giving it in Baghdad, we were uh, aiming to make it uh, ABO uh, specific. Uh, since then, we've transitioned to make it more uh, easily available. We're going with low titer O whole blood. So most of the uh, cold store data that you'll see now is with group O uh, whole blood instead of it being ABO specific. I want to talk about the differences in a few more slides. When we say late low titer, it's got to be at least less than uh, uh, 256 for anti-A and anti-B. So this, uh, the, the re, um, rediscovery of whole blood came with our first publication in 2009, a retrospective study got uh, tons of bias within it, although the groups were really equal when it came to severity of injury, ISS, base deficit, INR, location of injury. The only difference between the two groups was that the group that got whole blood, 30% of their blood volume transfused was whole blood. Uh, the component therapy group got red cells, plasma, and, and platelets. Even though the ratios of products were similar between the, the two groups. And you can see a 13% absolute uh, improvement in survival for those that received whole blood. So this made many people go, shit, maybe those guys are right. Or maybe this is made, there could be something to this. Because up until this point, it was just a bunch of crazy guys downrange doing shit that we weren't supposed to be doing. And it was having the US Army uh, mil uh, uh, leadership was really getting uh, concerned about it. And it was causing a big problem. We published this, and it made all the, all the noise kind of die, die down. It's also. Uh, interesting uh, to note that when you look at this study, the, when, you, when you give components compared to whole blood, there's a lot more anticoagulants and additives uh, within it. And when we calculated how much that would be, there was basically 800 mLs more uh, within those that received components compared uh, to whole blood. Um, Sean Nesson and I, with a few other people, also uh, looked at whole blood in a roll two hospital, which is basically a, um, a smaller um, surgical hospital that has limited capability. And here again, too, the use of whole blood was associated with improved uh, survival, uh, both using it or not, and then according to um, how much you used. I'll go faster, because Gare's telling me I'm out of time already. And then we have another analysis coming out soon. It's not published yet, but this is with 1,000 patients Again, using propensity matching to, com to compare those that received whole blood versus not, and a strong association with, with survival when uh, fresh whole blood is used compared to not. This is uh, warm whole blood, not, not cold stored. Now, you might say, well, Phil, well, that's great, but that's all retrospective data. I don't believe it until you do a trial. Well, you know what? There's, there are RCTs out there. They're in the pediatric population. They're not in trauma, but in uh, children that require cardiac surgery that have severe bleeding, where I trained in Philadelphia, they did a trial back in 1991. And the children that received cold whole blood, it was only stored for up to 48 hours, uh, compared to giving uh, components in a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio, there was much less blood loss uh, for cold stored uh, blood versus uh, components. And there was even was associated with uh, better platelet aggregation in the cold stored group. So there is some RCT data supporting uh, whole blood superiority compared to components. And then this is an unpublished study out of the, uh, the Norwegian group. Uh, Gare has led this, uh, this trial. This is with uh, cold apheresis platelets, but it supports the fact that 
uh, in a randomized controlled trial again, of adult cardiac surgery patients, cold stored platelets have less blood loss as well, uh, less chest tube output compared to those receiving room temperature uh, platelets. So, you know, a, a one of the biggest problems uh, with going with cold stored whole blood is that people said those, those platelets are not functional. Uh, they actually, they are uh, more functional. We've known that since the late 60s, early 70s, when they, they even did a randomized controlled trial of comparing warm to cold platelets in adults that were either thrombocytopenic uh, from uh, having cancer and chemotherapeutic agents, or they were thrombocytopenic, um, or they had low platelet function from being on aspirin. And in this trial, cold platelets, again, had a much better correction of bleeding time uh, compared to when warm platelets were used. So we've known for decades and a cold sore platelet is more hemostatically active, at least two RCTs showing it. So the fact that platelets are stored cold in whole blood should not prevent you from using whole blood. If anything, it should be the motivation to use it. But there's even some you know, potential problems with using warm platelets. This is a retrospective study that Kenji and Alba at a USC did. And when you see as the storage duration of warm platelets uh, goes up, there's increased risk of, of basically sepsis. The, the, this was a composite uh, outcome, uh, a morbidity outcome, but it was primarily uh, sepsis. Is that to try to get me to go faster? Here's a, so this is an important slide, so I'm going to have to spend time on it. When you think about the advantages uh, uh, of low titer O whole blood compared to a blood components, when the, it's a more potent uh, product. I showed you, well, I, I guess I'll show you the slide in a second or two. When you don't have to split whole blood up into components, it has a much higher hemoglobin, factor concentrations, and, and platelet uh, count. So it's more concentrated. You'll have more efficacy in re reversing blood failure. I've just talked about cold platelets and uh, improved hemostasis. You can now actually wind up increasing the storage of platelets by at least three times as much. Warm platelets can only be stored for five days. A cold store platelet, you have probably at least up to 15 days at the minimum to get equivalence compared to a warm uh, platelet. So the fact now that you can triple your storage duration means you can now start putting those platelets out at those hospitals that don't have them now, where patients are currently dying of bleeding. Okay, so the availability of a, a cold store platelet product dramatically increases when you go with low titer or whole blood, and this might be the biggest factor that improves outcomes uh, for patients because it will allow us to put whole blood or cold platelets in places where they're not available now. It's actually even safer to use a group O whole blood compared to trying to give uh, individual blood components. And that's just due to um, uh, human um, factors, making a mistake, right? When we try to type uh, red cells after we use maybe the first few units of, uh, of, o, of o negative red cells, then we try to switch to give them ABO-specific red cells. Human error leads to a 1 in 80,000 risk of a severe tr uh, transfusion reaction, which can cause uh, death. When you give group O whole blood, those red cells are always O. They don't change. They, they can, we continue using it throughout the resuscitation. So there's no risk of a severe hemolytic reaction. If anything, there's a risk of incompatible plasma when you're giving group O whole blood, but we do that every day with platelets, right? And you do it often with group A plasma to the group B and AB patients. So incompatible plasma is not, uh, doesn't cause any fatal reactions. So it's safer to give a group O whole blood than to use components where you wind up switching to uh, ABO compatible products. With cold whole blood, there's no bacterial contamination risk. When you use warm platelets, okay, that have plasma in it, there's a bacterial contamination risk. Okay, one in 5,000 units are contaminated with, uh, with a bacterial agent. Um, and then the, the logistic advantages, right? All those of you, all of us that resuscitate patients, okay, it's much easier to give one product compared to, compared to three, especially in the pre-hospital setting. Data on cold stored whole blood having better aggregation. I'll go through that faster. I'll, go, I'll skip past that. This is just showing you that uh, components when you, add, when you add them all back together, you wind up getting a very uh, dilute product compared to just using whole blood. Here we did the math, and there's, again, just as I showed you in our, in our trial, 
or in a retrospective study, there's about 800 mLs more of anticoagulants and additives when you give components. That anticoagulant citrate, that's not good for a bleeding patient, right? That's going to anticoagulate them. But that's what we're doing when we give components compared uh, to whole blood. I talked about that already. Um, up until a year or two ago, people would say, Phil, this is great, but I'm not allowed to give it. The standards don't allow for group O whole blood to, uh, to be used. So we said, fine, we're not going to let that stop us. Andre, myself, and Mark Gazer uh, for the Thor organization lobbied the ABB, and within three months, we got them to change the standards. And now uh, group O whole blood is an acceptable uh, blood product to be used, and I imagine in Europe, it's the same thing. Um, it's being used now. Since we've changed the standards, we've dramatically uh, increased the use of whole blood in the U.S. and, are, and in some places around the world. Uh, in Norway, uh, at Hawkland University, they're using it for their trauma patients. Uh, in Israel, they're using it throughout the entire country in their pre-hospital uh, uh, system. And many large uh, centers in the U.S. are now using whole blood. The number's actually up to 25 uh, now. We just did a survey. And 25% of hospitals have no limit on how much they're using. Since these programs are just starting to use whole blood, some of them have chose just to only uh, limit the amount that they're using. Uh, the mean is four, but some are going up to eight. And then 75% are using it for trauma only. The other 25% are recognize that a patient that has hemorrhagic shock has hemorrhagic shock. They're all, whether it's obstetric hemorrhage, GI hemorrhage, post-operative uh, bleeding from liver surgery, cardiac surgery. If you're exsanguinating, you're exsanguinating. And they're giving whole blood to those patients too. And by them doing that, it does make it easier for them to maintain an inventory and to use it within uh, their system. Um, there are some places that are using a lot of, of whole blood so far. In the past year or two, uh, Bergen has passed 100 patients so far. And in San Antonio, you know, uh, close to, to 300 as well too. And again, in San Antonio, the majority of patients actually don't have trauma uh, when they're using it for, for massive uh, bleeding. So in conclusion, uh, whole blood-based resuscitation, uh, I feel, is optimal for trauma-induced uh, blood failure. Um, and I think it's optimal compared to one to one to one for logistic efficacy and safety reasons. Um, and the pre-hospital benefit is better than not. I have a few more slides. Uh, what's the future, right? Because you can imagine bringing a low titer O whole blood pre-hospital in liquid form still has some logistical constraints. It's liquid, you have to keep it cold. Uh, in Washington University in St. Louis, uh, we've started a company and we're, we are developing a nanoparticle-based artificial red cell that can be freeze-dried. And so far in, in rabbits, it's, it's, it's working similarly to rabbit uh, red cells. We have a long way to go. But uh, it's, it's, it's um, very um, exciting to think about ultimately one day having an artificial red cell that's freeze-dried. I say artificial red cell, not HBOC, because uh, this nanoparticle uh, is packed with hemoglobin, 2,3-DPG, a methemoglobin reductase system, and the uh, shell is impervious to nitric oxide. It's basically, we have re-engineered a red cell that is, is freeze-dried. And uh, when you think about that, and the fact that you could add it, with uh, dried plasma, and there's even dried platelets in phase three trials now. We can have a dried whole blood equivalent in the next five to six years. That really uh, helps uh, the pre-hospital systems and even uh, in hospitals. So that's you know, where we're going in the future. People always ask, how do I get my Thor swag, right? You know, in the past, you'd have to beg Gary, and he'd bring you a t-shirt and stuff like that. So if you want to buy Thor gear, you can, now we're selling it on our website. So you can get your hat that Gary loves to wear, your Viking Law t-shirt, et cetera. So uh, that's where you get your stuff. Limerick Bills, where the idea of Thor started, you know, and uh, we say all the time, you know, blood is for bleeding, salt water is for cooking pasta, right? And, and beer is for drinking. Thank you. <laughs> you want to just keep going? Yeah. Hmm? OK. Um. Yes, it's just uh, Cermak 2019. So now since uh, Phil has uh, used uh, the double of the time that he was uh, alluded to, that I have to speak double fast and go through this uh, speedy. Uh, 
So before we got up my presentation, there was a Swedish girl in the audience here that told me that uh, normally you're a little bit too aggressive and a little bit too hard. Uh, so you should try to uh, to kind of be a little bit of a moderate. So. Your talk's out. Well. So next. Uh, so uh, since you told me that, I thought I'd start my slide with this very little provocative uh, introduction, uh, saying that there is different approaches to how we deal with hemorrhagic shock. Uh, it's different ideologies. It's almost like different religions. Uh, I'm not very religious myself. Um, and before I start my talk, uh, we have to. Probably have you read the news lately because you probably didn't have the time to read the news. Uh, so there's some uh, incoming news this morning uh, that uh, I just want to present to you. Uh, this is the breaking news from, uh, from UK uh, coming in this morning. Uh, a new euthanasia strategy uh, to save costs. NHS recommends silent to euthanize bleeding patient. Uh, this is another breaking news from Germany uh, that Germans don't bleed. Uh, and if they bleed, they don't bleed blood, bleed, bleed more than four, five leads. So that's kind of a physiological miracle. Uh, so going back to what I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to try to challenge guidelines. You know, everybody likes guidelines. There are different guidelines out there. You have PSTLS, you have HLS, you have uh, whatever. This is the European guidelines that was updated latest in 2016. It's, it tries to cover the uh, entire bundle of care from pre-hospital to, to in-hospital. Uh, and... Uh, I'm just going to question some of the some of the statements in these guidelines, uh, and uh, I'm I'm in love with red cells, and I'm going to talk a lot about hemoglobin uh, because I think hemoglobin actually matters, uh, and that the magic molecule that a lot of people are looking for magic molecules. The magic molecules is in the periodic table number eight. You know what magic molecule that is? It's oxygen. That's the magic molecule. So this is just uh, the, the grading of the evidence in European guidelines. 1A, strong recommendation, high quality evidence. 1B, strong recommendation, moderate quality, etc. Uh, and here is some of the things I'm going to challenge. Uh, and I'm going to ask if they are aligned with pathophysiology of shock. So they actually recommend using uh, crystalloid solutions initiated in the hypertensive bleeding patient, grade 1A. I wonder where those evidence paper are. I've been trying to look for those that evidence, uh, I can find it myself, uh, and they recommend a target hemoglobin of 7 to 9. And when you recommend 7 to 9, they accept 7. They do. Remember, they accept 7. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I'm not going to talk very much about this. I'm just going to throw it out to you, uh, because this is also in the CPR guidelines. Normal ventilate. When you do CPR, there's about one-third of the normal cardiac output going through your lungs. So why normal ventilate when one third of the blood that's normally goes to, through your lungs? So uh, you have at least have to define what is normal ventilation in regard to circulation. And they are target systolic blood pressure 80, 90, mean they accept 90, 80. So uh, just to look at different guidelines, these are, these are civilian guidelines uh, and these are military guidelines. So civilians, they bleed crystalloids initially, uh, then they bleed components. Uh, military trauma, they bleed whole blood as that is the preferred blood product, uh, if you are, have whole blood available, that should be your uh, resuscitation fluid of choice. Uh, and this is ranked from one to five, and only colloids or crystalloids if you don't have any else. Just to say what grading of anemia, this is from the National Cancer Institute. Everybody w w knows what anemia is. Uh, severe, 6.9 to 7.9. So to put it in a simple way, this guideline recommends severe anemia in for severe bleeding. Uh, they actually accept up to 50% hemodilution in severe bleeding, because that's what they do. And they promote a hypertensive resuscitation prior to surgical control and normal ventilation for all trauma patients. So this is uh, the problem, because we need, we, at least we have to define what is the problem. Uh, the problem is, of course, stop the bleeding, reverse the shock, and maintain hemostasis in the patient. That means that the problem is twofold. Uh, because I think it's important, especially when I try to explain to my blood bank is why we need blood. It's like in the period prior to surgical control, when you have an ongoing uh, uh, uncompressible bleed, you have ongoing central hypovolemia until surgical control. So that is, how do you deal with ongoing central hypovolemia to actually have best possible oxygen delivery in that period of time? 
Because oxygen delivery and lack of oxygen delivery is what, is it what kills you. So when you go from delivery, independent oxygen consumption to delivery, dependent oxygen consumption, that's when you're trying, to, that's when you're getting acidotic, you're getting uh, uh, actually global uh, cellular hypoxia. That's what's killing you. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about hypertensive recitation with the narrow uh, systolic blood pressure limit. Uh, understanding that having a, such a narrow limit of 80 to 90 is like almost mission impossible in the pre-hospital arena. E even blood pressure cuff is very inaccurate in that range of, of blood pressure. And I don't know if you have done massive recitation in the OR and if you are able to actually hold the systolic between 80 and 90. That is, to me, impossible. And now we require medics to do that uh, with blood pressure cuffs in the field. So uh, an oxymoron, just had to Google what an oxymoron is. So the, uh, one of the things that is, you have to understand the difference between in-hospital uh, recitation when the patient is in general anesthesia versus a pre-hospital spontaneous breathing patient. These are two different physiologies, uh, require two different approaches. Uh, so point of injury, there, timeline, uh, first responder, uh, start recitation, you are in the emergency room, you diagnostics and stabilization, you go into the OR, and you at some point you have hemorrhage control. So in all this period of time, you deal with central hypovolemia. That is your problem. How do you deal with that in that period of time? The longer that period of time is, that you should stay in the narrow limit of systolic 80 and 80. Is that sustainable with life? Uh, and I'm just going to challenge that to see if that's possible. So at some point you have hemorrhage control and normal volemia, and then, uh, because if you could have normal volemia in that period of time, you wouldn't have a problem. So uh, yesterday we, uh, Harris uh, referred to the Bickle study. Bickle study is actually one of the most uh, cited uh, uh, studies that started a permissive hypertensive era. But what does this really show? So if you look at the data here, uh, the same hemodynamic, hemodynamic profile from point of injury to the eight minute mark. This is the eight minute mark. F from the eight minute mark, they do the same recitation strategy. And what they find is if you look at the systolic blood pressure here, it's actually the same in both groups, no difference. And you have substantial mortality in this group, 70% in the immediate group and 62 in the delayed. Does this prove that hypertensive recitation is a good thing? Or does it prove that crystalloids are bad? I think it's the last. So uh, this is uh, Kevin Ward's uh, quote. You might have a different opinion, but you can't choose your own physiology. I need some water. This one. Cheers. I'm hemo deluding myself. So fixed equation is the relationship with the what is making up your oxygen delivery. There's hemoglobin, uh, arterial oxygenation, and corticoplant. That's it. Uh, so oxygen consumption, uh, remember that you can only extract 70% of the oxygen delivered. You can only take three out of four oxygen molecules from your hemoglobin. Uh, so if you are a, an average soldier, 85 kilo, will have a resting uh, oxygen consumption uh, of about 300 ml per minute because uh, average uh, resting like when we are sitting here the average resting oxygen consumption is about 140 150 ml per square meter per minute meaning that the critical do2 for this 85 kilo solar is 430 per minute below this below this you will have global cellular hypoxia another word for shock and that is not sustainable with life because 70% of 430 is 300. That means critical DO2, 430. So we can start playing with the numbers. So uh, just remember, so the speed of the bleed is important here, but the, we are trying to rescue these patients who bleed fast. Uh, and when you're bleeding fast, you, you, your blood pressure and cardiac output is reduced rapidly accordingly. So if you, uh, Medical Physiology by Guyton, Guyton, you have to read this book. Uh, it's about the relationship, if you draw 40% of your total blood volume in 30 minutes, cardiac output is 50%. So according to the Guyton and also some Vic Convertino research group have done some LBNP, low bo lower body negative pressure chamber with good compensators show that 
when they reach the systolic 80 to 90 marks, the cardiac output is 50% reduced. So we don't measure cardiac output in these patients because we, we would like to measure it, but we can't measure it. So we measure what we can measure. We measure blood product, blood pressure, which might not be the best indicator for perfusion. But Emerson, he figured this out in 1945. So this is known physiology. Systolic pressure below 85, 85 is an average blood volume loss of 40%. And systolic of 100 is less than 25%. So they used, uh, their strategy was to resuscitate to at least 100. And that's based on a huge number of patients that they resuscitated in the field. So uh, just to figuring the out critical DO2 lowest survivable hemoglobin with a cardiac output of 3. Because it's a systolic 80 to 90 is cardiac output of 3. Then your lowest survivable hemoglobin is 10.91. And if your saturation is 90, the cutoff is 11.88. And the guideline recommends 7 to 9. Uh, figuring out critical DO2 and lowest survivable cardiac output with a hemoglobin of 7 is actually 4.67 liters in the patient that I, I just mentioned as this single character. That means that the conclusion that the guideline along for hemoglobin as low as 7 requires close to normal volemia. And that is, our problem is that we cannot acquire normal volemia. We actually ha oh, this is central hypovolemia all the time. So this is not survivable at all. Uh, so just showing this curve is shown one more time. This is a relationship with the, the oxygen delivery and the oxygen consumption. And you have a critical DO2. This is the inflection point of the curve. And if you are here on the curve, from here to there will be oxygen deficit. And the time spent below uh, the critical DO2 is gaining up what is called oxygen depth that has to be repaid. And the higher the oxygen depth, the, 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 the higher the mortality. So you don't like to be there, so your patient, you want to, what you do when you resuscitate, you want to have your patient on the right side of the red line, uh, and you don't want to be too narrow, so this is your danger zone, uh, and this is where you want to be when you resuscitate. Uh, a path is going to show a little bit more of this curve. So now, seeing this in a little bit different way. This is time here. This is critical DO2 for this single patient, 430. Uh, good compensators, 50% reduction in cardiac output systolic 80 and 90. So remember, those of stroke correlates with degree of coagulopathy and inflammation and mortality. So you don't want to spend much time below the red line. So now, here's the point of injury. DO2 is uh, falling due to bleeding, and the reason it's falling is cardiac output is falling. Hemoglobin doesn't, doesn't fall uh, in the initial when you bleed fast. So here's shock. So when you're in the OR, and you have, like, when your surgeon just flips the some of the bleeding organs and he starts bleeding, do you start to resuscitate uh, when the patients are in shock or you do you resuscitate prior to shock? All guidelines tell us you should start resuscitation when you show signs of shock. So you start here. Maybe is that too late and you try to be above the line. So the uh, time span below the line, the area uh, under the curve is the dose of shock. Uh, the green is aerobic metabolism. Uh, and just gonna have done some nice animation here. Uh, so you could do this with different products. If you give it whole blood, you are able to stay above that line because the hemoglobin is between 12 to 13, uh, one to one to one. Yes, you can uh, you can maintain that for a period of time, but uh, uh, finally you will be below the line. I'll tell you why. Uh, so this is whole blood. And you see the area under the curve, but that's when you start recitation, when you show signs of shock. So you will acquire some uh, oxygen depth uh, if you don't start earlier. If you start on mechanism of injury only doesn't and don't wait for the shock to appear, you might be able to stay above the red line all the time. Uh, so this is with uh, uh, one to one to one. Remember, if you give one to one to one in an exchange transfusion, you will, if you're lucky, uh, have hemoglobin of nine. Hemoglobin of 9, in my, if you put it into fixed equation, will give you a DO2 of 354, which is below the critical DO2 of 440. So if spontaneous breathing patient, ongoing bleeding with components in an exchange transfusion, will not have uh, enough oxygen delivery if you give components. And if you give saline, uh, the curve is even worse. Uh, and if you will uh, start intubate here, uh, I think uh, Pat is going to show you what that's going to be like. Here is a hemoglobin of 7. That's 276, uh, which the difference between critical DO2 and the actual DO2 is massive. 
So what targets? This is a study from Eastridge, uh, 7,180 US military casualties. They, they measured systolic blood pressure upon arrival in the emergency room. So uh, it started with around 110, and the lower it was, the higher the mortality. So the guideline aim at a mortality of 20%. That's what it says. So do, do we think to aim at the mortality of 10% is a good thing? I would aim at 0%. Then you have, I think you want to be here on the curve and not here. Uh, so the same is for, for a traumatic brain injury. And by the way, uh, the guideline tells you that if you have ongoing bleeding without TBI, you should not pop the clot and keep systolic between 80 and 90. If you have TBI and ongoing bleeding, then you should just give a shit about popping the clot. But then the guideline says you should keep s uh, mean, mean arterial pressure of 80. So if we think that we can maintain a mean arterial pressure of 80 with ongoing bleeding and TBI, wh why don't we do that in those without TBI? Well, uh, just remember, outcomes following trauma laparotomy is that if they arrive in the emergency room hypotensive, the mortality is 50%. If they're not hypotensive, the mortality is 12.4%, meaning that hypotension in this group of patients is not good. Uh, this just a reminder uh, that you can read this in Mollison, that is the Bible of blood bankers. Uh, if you give old red cells, and actually it starts on day 21 around, upon transfusion, after 10 minutes, 25% of your red cells is gone from the circulation. They are actually gone. That is not very efficient transfusion, giving old red cells when 25% of your blood is just gone from the circulation within 10 minutes. So that means if you give one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one in a massive transfusion in the hospital where first in, last out is mainly the, what the blood bankers do, that they give you the oldest blood for this patient. Meaning that if you acquire a hemoglobin of 10 with 1 to 1 to 1 with old red cells, then your patient end up with a hemoglobin of 7.5 because 25% of 10 is 2.5 minus 10 is 7.5. So you, the guideline using 1 to 1 to 1, they cannot recommend a hemoglobin uh, above 9 because it's unacquirable. So sub analysis, uh, analysis of proper studies showed actually the first time that we were able to show that older red cells has impact on mortality. All the other studies that is done in this area is done in patients in the ICU who is normal volemic, which is another animal. So uh, Phil showed you this. This is just uh, plasma in our circulation and we see it's 55%. When you give one to one to one, the plasma volume is 38. Uh, in whole blood is 48. Uh, hemoglobin is 9 to 10, here is 12 to, 12 to 13. So if you transfuse, this is our uh, trauma pack in Bergen. Uh, if you give 6 units of home blood and compare to uh, 6 to 6 to 2, total volume transfused 3,000 ml, real blood is 2,622. And here you see uh, you have to uh, transfuse actually 4,150 ml to equal uh, uh, 6 units of whole blood. So uh, if there are a lot of green people in here, uh, then this is also the advantage of uh, whole blood is organic, natural, non-GMO free, range gluten free, high in protein, low in carbs. So uh, save the planet, give whole blood. Uh, this is the Emerson from 1945, and uh, I love to read old papers, but there's a lot of experience in those data, showed how people did it in the early stages of time, when they recognized that hemodilution was bad, uh, the considerable proportion of patients in severe shock failed to respond adequately to plasma because the US entered the World War II using only plasma as a resuscitating fluid. And in, in the North African campaign, they had to borrow a lot of UK whole blood. Uh, that pisses Americans off, but there's a lot of UK blood running in the veins of America, and they don't like that. So in the last year of the war, they had a whole blood program. They shipped 500,000 units of whole blood uh, uh, to the theater in Europe the last year of the war. So hemodilution in is inadequate DO2 death by hemodilution. So uh, he, he just stated uh, that the total average volume of plasma blood required to produce elevation of arterial pressure below 85 to 100 was average 1,250. And they used 100 as their cutoff for resuscitation. That, may, that might be 
a better cutoff. Uh, uh, I'm not saying that hypotensive resuscitation should be done. It's just where is the, where do you set your, your limit? Where's your, where's your threshold? Uh, this again, uh, two liters of blood preoperatively, or if not advocate, another thousand. To uh, gain a trigger pressure to approximately 100 millimeter of mercury. Uh, this is also their experience using more than 1,000 cc, a liter of plasma, in treatment of severe shock, resulted in profound anemia, and especially prone to develop irreversible shock. Still, their, own, their experience was that hemodilution is not good at all, kills patients. Uh, I'm just going to show you this. This is a Korean slide. This is a Korean war. Remember, in the Korean War, they used 400,000 units of cold stored whole blood, Group O only. Group O only, with non-registered severe hemolytic transfusion reactions, and it was given to everyone. If you look at, this is evac time, average, two and a half hour. And, and this is severe shock with a case fatality rate of 21%, which is not that bad at all. If you compare your own hospital with this blood use and, and theta mortality rate, I'm pretty sure you will not be better than this. But see here, 4.4 liters was given prior to surgery. So why did they, this is not the golden hour, this is like a golden two and a half hour, and they still lived and they survived. And more than 50% of the blood was used pre-hospital and in hospital prior to surgery, uh, just saying. So uh, this is from 2015. Uh, Bruce L. Robertson, one of the pioneers in uh, battlefield transfusion, transfusion of whole blood suggestion for a more frequent deployment in war surgery. Actually, he's just uh, stating that when you lose blood, you need blood. Uh, and he also stated that adding uh, saline solution doesn't really work very well. Uh, so uh, I'd just say perfuse it or lose it. Uh, and uh, as we have a saying that uh, T-shirts save lives, this is a t-shirt that this is a quote from Pat Thompson, who is going to be the next speaker. Uh, and if we have questions, we're going to have all the questions in the end. Uh, we're going to have a panel discussion, if you'll like to stay here. Uh, and uh, I like quotes a lot, so uh, this is how things change, by the way. And um, since we all like drinking beer, just remember that the Tour Network has its own beer. Low Titer O Brew. From actually Norwegian Virgin Low Tide O Brew Bay. So that's uh, th this is a warning for the next speaker, who is Pat Thompson, a very interesting guy. He is a paramedic. He's part of the network. He is uh, he's too smart to me. So uh, I think you're going to enjoy his lecture. Pay attention. Don't sleep. Don't don't fall asleep now because this is going to be good. So. Uh, <laughs> How do we how do we shift the uh, <coughs> the the slides along? Okay, I have videos coming up. There's three individual videos. You have to click each box. So no. Launch my. Thing. Is it good? Yeah. In the immortal words of Monty Python, now for something completely different. So I'm going to be talking about a topic that has been, I think, very well covered um, during this conference, maybe from a slightly different angle. But as I like gear, yeah, I particularly like history, I'm going to start off with some history and hopefully draw a correlation to what I'm talking about a little bit down the line. So um, there's lots of people that I'd you know, like to thank, everyone at Thor, and some people that I've uh, worked with for a long time. And it's been a 
an incredible journey for me to um, to learn what I have, and my my interest in in shock is directly related to my time in the military and the the number of soldiers that die. About 91% of them die from preventable death of hemorrhagic shock, and that's driven my interest. So, um, <coughs> we've been delivering care for a long time. So this is a uh, this is a pottery from uh, ancient Greece, and this is showing the Battle of Troy, and you can. You can see a, a soldier being bandaged, uh, bandaged there. That's Ach Achilles. Um, so Brad Pitt. And then uh, in slightly more recent times, we've got uh, yeah, modern conflicts, and we've been doing things. We've been doing things to try help people. A lot of innovations been driven by war. Um, some of the things that we've done have helped, and some of the things that we've done have harmed. And this is kind of like what I'm trying to talk about. So successful. You know, we can be successful in our procedures, but we may not always be successful in our outcomes. So um, there is a drive to do something, right? So, uh, so this is Hippocrates. He's been around for, uh, for a long time, and uh, through the ages, there's something that has been ubiquitous in medical care for probably about four and at least four and a half thousand years, and that is we bled people. Right? That is what physicians did. No matter what was wrong with you, we even bled people for bleeding. Right, if you can believe that, right, and um, all the way up to actually the 19th century and the invention of modern photography, we were still bleeding people. So, how did we manage to do this procedure for so long without stopping? Right, and this is what kind of what, what I'd like to talk about. So, and the reason is, right, is we've got two differences here. If a an intervention is performed and you survive then the physician immediately claims uh, the credit for that. Um, and then if the patient dies, it's obviously died because he had non-survivable injury or illness. And this is, this is kind of ubiquitous. So, so like uh, Louis XIV was bled over a thousand times. And obviously the ailments that caused him, right, he recovered from, and that was due to the skill in bleeding of his personal physician. But this is George Washington, right? He was critically ill probably septic, and they removed two and a half liters of his circulating volume, right? So of all the American presidents that needed two and a half liters removing from their blood volume, I would say he wasn't the right guy. <laughs> probably a more modern candidate either I would have chosen. So, um, but, but right, so, so, so when we, we have something uh, I, I refer to as iatrogenic blindness. We are blind in medicine to the harm that we do. And, uh, and, I, and I think that, that this continues, has always been, and it still continues. And we, we have to, we ha I mean, the, the rise of evidence-based medicine has tried to address this. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. So doing something in modern times, anybody know what this is? Anybody like to hazard a guess? <laughs> well done, sir. You obviously <laughs> you got some interesting hobbies. Um, <laughs> so, 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 so they stationed these along the Thames. Right, and uh, and then if somebody fell into the river and drowned, they were hauled out, and then you you blew pipe smoke up somebody's ass. Right, so um, you know, and uh, anybody know who this gentleman is? Right, Nobel. Sorry. All oh, right, yeah, he he he's a Nobel laureate for medicine. Amazing procedure he invented, the frontal lobotomy. Right, and even more modern times, we've got clear fluids. So I, you know, I was trained up in the 80s, and I used to pride myself that I could like pressure infuse six liters of crystalloid into my patients before they got to hospital. So and 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 uh, and just like everybody before us, and just like the bleeding, we suffer from that iatrogenic blindness. So, what's the problem? So as we have more, as we've entered the enlightenment we've started to realize the harm that we do in trying to do good. And it's, uh, it's, it doesn't sit very well in the conscious. And that, is, and that has led to like the gold, what's called the golden rule of medicine, that I don't have to explain this to anyone. But so often this is forgotten, right? First, do no harm. And, uh, and uh, I'd like to talk a little bit uh, about how we decide to do that. Because now we have two contradicting things. We want to do good and we want to do no harm, right? And this is a balance, and it's a very delicate balance. And we have to try and negotiate this every single time we treat a patient. So we have to use clinical judgment. And um, this is the hardest thing to train. So you, you can have guidelines, and guidelines are often wrong, as Gia just spoke about. 
So we have to try, we have to sometimes look beyond guidelines and we have to sometimes use other tools and, and how do we do this clinical gu judgment, right? So um, if you want to do no harm, you have to be very conservative in your approach. And if you want to do something, and you, you're going to have to be more aggressive. So it's this balance. When should we be aggressive and jump in and do something? And when should we, when we, should, should we be more conservative? So uh, down to judgment, right? So this is just a model that I like to use. So how can we do this? Right? And I like this uh, Venn diagram because there's overlap. So we, ha we have um, physiology. We've got evidence. We've got experience. And we've got reason. And we need all of them. And the reason that we need all of them is everyone's like, yeah, evidence-based medicine, that's the only way to go. And yet, when we've got world experts standing up there, everyone says almost the same thing. The evidence is poor. So we cannot just utilize evidence. We have to back evidence up with understanding of physiology as best as we can at the moment. And we have to actually look what works. So there's a, there's a great paper about, um, the, the you know, uh, double blinding ra randomized control study on parachute use, right? So, so <laughs> you know, like there's never been an RCT, right? So that means you shouldn't use a parachute, uh, parachute. And what the point that they're trying to make is that the observational power of experimentation and doing what works has to be considered. And then we have to, things have to be reasonable. So if you can take more of these, the more of these, the more of these Venn diagrams that you have overlap on, then the more aggressive you can be. And the less of them that you can tick, probably the more conservative you should be. And so you can use this as a tool to work out where, where you should lie. And um, if you are aggressive and you have a lot of these bases covered, I think that you will have a successful procedure or a successful intervention and a successful outcome. But if you, are, if, you have, if you are aggressive and you don't have many of these covered, I think that you'll have successful procedure and unsuccessful outcome. Right, so, I'm sure everybody's seen this photo. Okay. So, how should we treat this patient? Right, so, this is pretty much what I'm going to talk about. I like to give a takes a case study to kind of, and make it real, to make it visceral. Right? So. I'm sure everybody would probably use some kind of a strategy, structured approach, whether it's march if you're military, whether it's CABCDE, might just be ABCDE. Probably a lot of people would start off with the blood that's flowing out. And the reason that this guy's probably still conscious is that somebody's holding uh, one of his arteries um, closed off in his hand. And then we'd move on to airway and breathing and then back to circulation. So I would like to think that probably this would go through almost everybody's head here. And this is what I'd like to look at, right? So aggressive use of tourniquets. Well, you know, this is not the main focus of my talk. And I'll be talking in the workshop a little bit about it. But, you know, I would like to argue that there is, you know, that we have, we have, uh, and we understand the physiology of using tourniquets very well. Um, we have now lots of published data from the, from the, Conflicts from recent conflicts, you know, we have experience and, you know, in personal experience and experience of everybody that I've talked to, if they are applied properly, they work and they save life and it stands to reason. So when you can tick off all of these things, you know, what you have here is an aggressive approach, right? But you have a successful procedure with a successful outcome. And um, my next thing is where maybe the controversy will start, right? RSI and positive pressure ventilation in hemorrhagic shock. So, we got this guy. Can we be aggressive? Can we ag be aggressive with uh, RSI and pre-hospital anesthesia and, uh, and uh, positive pressure ventilation once we've induced anesthesia? So, here's a question. You are the receiving clinician of this casualty. Show of hands. Who here would RSI this guy? One. Only one. Two. Okay. I'll make it slightly more challenging. This guy deteriorates on his way to you. And he gets to you and he is now unresponsive to pain stimulus. Now, who would RSI this guy? He's got bilateral amputations, catastrophic hemorrhage, 
and he's unresponsive. Who would RSI the guy? So it's five or six. Actually, not that many. So, Well, <laughs> this is what I'd like to talk about because a lot of the speakers uh, that we've had you know, have, uh, have uh, pretty much um, discussed quite aggressive approaches to RSI. So, so let's talk about that. And I'm going to talk about each of these fears and look at a couple of things and then kind of draw a conclusion. So let's look at the physiology. So what's our definition of shock? Gears covered some of this. So it is when the delivery of oxygen is a mismatch between delivery and consumption. And we have global cellular hypoxia. Then we have a lot of associated pathologies. And it's not just these, it's a lot more. Turns out shock is very, very complicated. But we must remember that the driver of almost all of these are both the tissue injury and the associated oxygen death and the blood failure, as Gear spoke about. So if the problem here in shock is DO2, I'd like to take a little bit of a closer look at DO2. So Gears put this in here. I just want to double tap it to make sure everybody's tracking here. So, so you can see that we have points of injury. And as our DO2 drops, we have no drop in VO2 right? until we hit critical DO2. And then we have decompensation. What happens to our lactate? Well, that's almost the inverse. So because we have no drop in VO2 until we hit critical DO2, these two path. And this is why right, we use tools to check for metabolic acidosis almost as a definition for shock. How, how, can, how can this work? How can it, well, basically our oxygen extraction ratio increases and then our venous, so we're just pulling more of the magic molecule. We're pulling more oxygen out of the blood. <sighs> Quite important. By definition, when you go over the edge of this cliff, right, and you are generating oxygen debt, you are hypoperfused, and that is why this is happening. You are hypoxic, but you have glo systemic global hypoxia, and you are developing acidosis. And if you remember one of the previous talks talked about uh, what, um, what's his name, uh, Scott Weingott calls the hop, the hop killers, there we have the hop killers for RSI, right, right there, by definition in shock. Okay, so, but the problem here is DO2. So what I'd like to do is talk about um, that in a little bit more detail. So Gears covered some of this as well. So DO2 is this equation. And there's only three variables. So if shock is this drop in DO2 to where it passes critical DO2, then we must, if we're going to do something about this, we must understand these three variables, and this is where it all takes part. So let's look at cardiac output, because in shock, cardiac output is the problem. So cardiac output has to equal venous return, right? It is, it, that is axiomatic, right? The heart can only pump out what it gets back in. And... Um, Here's a, here's a diagram. It actually turns out that uh, venous return is horrendously comp uh, complicated, um, but there's some, there's some agreement. I'm going to uh, simplify it slightly onto what people agree with, and uh, here the, the conclusion is that venous return and preload are the problem, right? And now we know that what we're looking at, just to remember, like that... Uh, that equation, if you were wondering what those, what those items were and, and what the numbers were. So we need to look at venous return and have a little bit of an understanding of venous return, right? So that's Guyton in the top right-hand corner that uh, Gear was looking at as well. He did a lot of the primary work in the 50s on venous return. And, um, and uh, uh, venous return, it turns out, is, is, is actually it's, it's quite controversial. And not, not all the physi physiologists agree, and it's uh, complex, almost beyond measure. And, uh, and they, they, in 2006, they had a big conference to try and work out some balance between all these opposing views and whatever. But I'm going to present some of the things that, that people agree on, right? So the problem, particularly in, um, in shock, is that we lose our volume as everybody knows. So our circulating volume is falling out. It's a thing. We're getting less back in, right? So there are compensatory mechanisms. So that is the main driver. That's our problem is we've lost volume. And then that is reducing venous return. So, so we have to look at how can we compensate. So obviously, there's, uh, we can increase systemic vascular resistance, one of the other main compensatory mechanisms. And one of the great effectors of venous return is the respiratory pump. We also then have the musco, um, 
the Musco Valinus pump, right, and uh, venous res uh, resistance, as I said. So, so we'll look at a couple of graphs here. So this is the pressure inside the inside the vascular system, and you can see it's obviously very high on the arterial side and very low at the at the at the venous side, right? So, so it doesn't show because this is just the vasculature, the lowest point, the lowest pressure in the entire system is in the right atrium, and that is zero, right? So that's at zero pressure above atmospheric pressure. So it turns out it takes very little pressure to alter that. And here you have a graph where it's showing you how as right atrial pressure increases, this produces a back pressure to venous return, and it doesn't take much. And the, the greatest change is at the lowest pressure. So when you go from zero to one millimeter of mercury, you have a reduction of 14% in venous return. So that is significant. And we have to think about what happens when we move to positive pressure ventilation, right? So you've got, you've got these two pumps working. So the job of the muscular pump is to move the blood back to the large, uh, the large veins inside, the, inside the, the torso. And then the, the, aim, uh, the job of the respiratory pump is to shift that blood to the right atrium. And it does this, as you, breathe, as you breathe in, the diaphragm contracts and flattens and raises the intra-abdominal pressure, simultaneously lowering the intra-thoracic pressure. And blood flows into the right atrium. And then on expiration, that's reversed. So this is a pump, it's a low pressure pump. And this pump, pump uh, and, and, and this uh, respiratory pump is ensuring that your cardiac out venous return is maintained, cardiac output is maintained. So. What do we do when we are assigned positive pressure ventilate, right? Well, we disconnect that respiratory pump. So the, 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 the positive pressure ventilation increases right atrial pressure, which decreases um, uh, venous return, which drops cardiac output. And there, there is almost no way to get around this, okay? Not only that, we disconnect the muscular pump because we paralyze our patients. And then also, we decrease vascular resistance. So we make, basically make the container bigger. So there are, there are multiple serious problems. All of this is pretty much undisputed and pretty well described and well known. So what are we doing? So if we go back to this curve, which we really like it for, for explaining what's going on, when you RSI and you positive pressure ventilate somebody, you are shifting them the wrong way. We want to be going right and you are moving them left. You are not buying them time. You are moving them closer to disaster. Now, Right? Just like when we're talking about bleeding our patients, if they are not too bad, right, they will survive. They will survive this. But if they are over here, right, where our shock patients are, it's, it's frequently and most often catastrophic. So let's look at the evidence. Right? So this is a paper. Um, uh, uh, David Lockie's spoken yet uh, um, at this conference. Survival in trauma patients that have pre-hospital tracheal intubation without anesthesia or muscle relaxants observational study. Right? 486 trauma patients intubated without drugs who were not in cardiac arrest. One survived. Okay, that is a, that is a mortality rate of 99.8%. Number needed to harm is one. Right, so not very good. So it turns out, right, that in our critically ill patients, right, they just don't survive. They just don't survive. And we know, so, so some people say, well, well, then we've got to use some drugs. But everybody knows that the sicker the patients are, the more dangerous the drugs are. That's why a lot of these patients were intubated with, uh, with no drugs. So you get caught in that loop and you can't escape it, right? So very, very bad for our most seriously injured trauma patients. So then this, right, pre-hospital tracheal intubation, passive pressure ventilation is associated with hypertension, decrease in survival in, in hypervolemic trauma patients, right? So look at this. Um, what they showed, right, that uh, de showed decreased survival, and then they, they correlated this directly to positive pressure ventilation. So is this all high quality evidence? No. Right, but it's, we have to look for, we've looked at the physiology and understanding of it, and now we have to look, and I think that there is significant trends in this data, and it's not looking good for, for uh, RSI and positive pressure ventilation. Okay, so um, 
one quarter, one quarter of emergency RSIs have a hypertensive e episode. This is normovolemic. So you can imagine if you've got normovolemic patients and one quarter of them are having hypertensive episodes that's harming them, imagine the seriously injured non-normovolemic or hypovolemic patients and what the outcome is. Factors associated with the occurrence of cardiac arrest after emergency tracheal intubation in the emergency department. If, you're, you have a, if you have a systolic blood pressure right, equal to or less than 90, you have a statistically significant chance of going into cardiac arrest when you're intubated. Oh, and what's the target for your, for your hypertensive resuscitation? Right, so you can't have both here. You just can't have both. It's, you know. Right, so this systemic review. This is a systematic review and meta-analysis comparing mortality and pre-hospital tracheal intubation to emergency. And it showed worse, worse for pre-hospital intubation. So this is our highest level of evidence, if you grade evidence meta-analysis, especially with, uh, uh, or um, systematic review with, uh, with, with, with meta-analysis, the highest level of evidence. The problem with this paper is that the authors graded this evidence as very poor, and the, and the, and the chance of there being bias is very high. So it's a meta-analysis of poor evidence. But, you know, the take-home message from here is, is, is the authors include the sentence, which I think is very pertinent. Cardiovascular collapse and an, is a known complication of uh, tracheal intubation in this patient group. Some centers deliberately postpone intubation. And uh, I would argue that those centers that deliberately postpone intubation can only be optimizing their patient outcome. And then, so this is... Um, uh, Tony Hudson's paper, along with uh, some of the people that have spoken here already. Airway and ventilation management strategies and hemorrhagic shock. To tube or not to tube, that is the question. And this is taken from their uh, conclusion where they, they outline some of the potentially harmful effects that I've spoken about. And um, the, benefit, the benefit of maintaining a spontaneous breathing patient. Delayed intubation should be strongly recommended. Delayed till when? Well, if you can, delayed to the point of surgery. And we know this, right? So there are, there are loads uh, of people that, uh, not like me, that work in OR, and they say, like, if they're getting a AAA, um, like, they will absolutely not, not uh, have, you know, put them under anesthesia until the surgeon is standing there, and then it's like a countdown, because they know that as they RSI, these, or as they anesthetize these patients, they often just arrest. So, you know, this is, this is uh, not really new. So, so that's the evidence as it is. Um, it's not particularly brilliant evidence, so that's why we have to rely on all of the other circles of the Venn diagram here. So, experience, right? Environmental complexity. As we move further from the OR towards the point of injury, right, we have an increase in environmental complexity. So it goes here along. So, you know, you've got the OR, You've got the ER, you've got the ambulance or maybe HEMS, and then in the military, you've got maybe an even more challenging environment, and then it ends up, you know, right up the pointy end. I don't know how many guys have been there, but it's not much fun. And, um, I, you know, I think that this is, once again, this is an axiomatic statement that where we have increasing environmental complexity, right, we've got to decrease the technical and cognitive complexity if we want to have successful procedures and successful outcomes. And I think that, I believe that that is axiomatic. And that's my experience, certainly. When you, when you bring complexity into complex environments, the outcome is almost always bad. So, adverse effects. <sighs> Loss of global awareness and fixation error. And I mean, you know, uh, this, is, this is, anybody who works for your hospital, it's such a problem to try to deal with. And so this also depends on the n amount of resources that you have. So if you can come with, you know, two anesthetists, seven paramedics, 20 firemen or whatever, then, then maybe you have enough to deal with this. But, you know, the, 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 the less resources, the less chance you're going to be effective. Prolonged on-scene times. So our trauma patients, the shorter the time from point of injury to surgical control of hemorrhage determines outcome. And we often have very long on-scene times, particularly with difficult uh, access and difficult intubations. So that's pretty bad. 
um, complex decision making, right? It's very resource intensive. We get difficult and failed intubations, uh, not, not intubating on first pass, going down, yeah, difficult airway uh, or failed intubation paradigms, hyperventilation. Because if you just want physician, who's doing the, the ventilation and how trained are they? And in a high stress environment, hyperventilation is almost consistent unless you're using a timing device. And I don't trust anyone, and I even a consultant anesthetist in a highly stressful pre-hospital environment to not hyperventilate. And that hyperventilation and breath stacking is lethal to these, um, to these uh, hypervolemic patients. You increase the chance of tension in your thorax, right? And then you've got your... You've got your three H's or Scott Weingart's um, uh, hop killers, right? And we end up with this, right? This, these nine letters that seem to somehow always be put together, right? And even if you are a Jedi master of uh, anesthesia and, uh, and intubation, you cannot avoid the physiological soliloquy of your intervention. And uh, there are some absolute experts here, and I appreciate that in their hands and in a high resource environment, this, you know, it, you may have a slightly better outcome, but that is absolutely not the case in the rest of the world. So, the reality, can you play that, please? Oh, yeah. no, you have to go ba uh, back, and then you have to wiggle the, you have to wiggle the mouse up. Yeah, yeah, almost. And then click on the little arrow. There we go. Right. Now, I'd like to say that I'm not picking on these physicians, uh, on these uh, clinicians. They are there. They're doing their very best to try and help somebody who's critically injured. And, uh, you know, and it, it turns out it's a, it's a young 17-year-old boy that's fallen through glass, and he is bleeding to death. So the, the yeah, next one. There we go. Right. So the decision is made, what they're going to do. So the decision is made. His uh, conscious uh, level of consciousness is dropping, so they decide to RSI him and positive pressure ventilate. And then unsurprisingly, next one. No, no, next one. Can you do the, the, the last one on the right? No output. Okay, we have to start CPR. Right, so a lot of people will say, this is inevitable. This patient was going to die anyway at not survivable injuries. Yes, that may be true, but the procedure that was done did not help that patient. That pushed them closer towards shuffling off this mortal coil, right? And that's not our job, right? They've got a word for that. That's called euthanasia, right? That's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to buy a patient's time, and certainly no time was bought for that patient, and this happens more frequently. And then, very interestingly, these guys are, are omitted from a lot of the studies. Right? These guys that are RSI, positive pressure ventilated, going to arrest, they go, no, that's going to confound our numbers, going to confound our data. So, so, th so they omit them. So in that meta-analysis, right, they omitted all the, all the, the, the pre-hospital cardiac arrests. So <laughs> kit dumps pretty important with... Um, you know, when, you, when you're doing your RSI. So I've come up with a new template, which I'll be selling soon. So um, I don't know if anybody, if there'll be any takers, if you're going to RSI and tube in, in uh, your cardiac arrest, um, in your hemorrhagic shock patient, uh, you might want to use that, that layout. And reason. What is killing my patient? You can't fix a C problem with a, a intervention that makes the C problem worse. Right, just on the chance that they may have an airway problem down the line. And there is no evidence that level of consciousness right, uh, is, is, is connected to, to outcome. There is no evidence for that. And if you want to look at that, just go down to Cardiff or anywhere in the UK, any one of the UK's large cities, to the drunk tanks right, over the weekend and look at the GCS of the average people in there. And they almost all survive. Okay, so... So... If you arrive at a hypoglycemic patient, right, do you RSI them or do you give them sugar? Right? And if you arrive at a hypovolemic trauma patient, do you RSI them or do you give them blood? And I think it's a good question. Right? So that's, that's reason. Right? So in my estimation, looking at my little Venn diagram of my clinical judgment, 
right? I would say that um, the chances of this procedure being successful are limited unless we alter something, right? So what's the problem, right? Because al almost nobody stuck their hands up and said they would do it anyway, right? The problem is that it's in the guidelines, right? And lots of guidelines. I didn't have time to trawl through them all, but, you know, um, uh, mandatory is the word that the uh, European... European guidelines use. And then here's good old Scott Weingart's guideline for resuscitation. What's number one? Right? Assess SpO2 and ventilation with a view to early intubation for, for, for massive hemorrhage. Right? So there's a, you know, there's, there's a bit of a problem here. So um, somebody said this before. Resuscitation before intubation. Right? So, so, so the message is getting out there. And I would say that RSI and positive pressure ventilation is a relative contrary indication relative to the resuscitation. You have to resuscitate your patient to get them into the physiological condition such that they will survive your, uh, survive your intervention because that's how, that's how bad it is, right? So, so if we want to know how to resuscitate, that is what Gia's spoken about and Phil's spoken about already, and that's probably the best way to go, right? So this idea of a little bit of clear fluid, which we know makes patients worse, and, uh, and uh, makes all makes the endotheliopathy works, makes the uh, um, the coagulopathy worse, and vasopressors, which uh, you know, are shown to actually increase end, 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 end organ ischemia. You know, that's that's probably not the way to go. So, what is the way to go? Right. <laughs> I think you you, <laughs> you probably can tell by this point that we've got some kind of essential theme going. Right. So it's it's blood based, blood based resuscitation, and with uh, whole blood as being probably the optimal. So that's uh, that's uh, that's my talk, and uh, you know I would I would like to conclude. Well, sorry, um, don't be blind to the hydrogenic pathology of your interventions. So you know I am um, um, David Lockie said, um, what you know why are we still justifying with this? Uh, why are we still justifying this? And I would counter that with uh, it, that it's our job to justify things, and it's our job to use uh, good clinical judgment to decide whether or not we are doing harm, because uh, that first rule of medicine of not doing harm is absolutely critical for us as physicians to ensure that uh, we optimize outcome for our patients. Thanks. <laughs>